Okay. Great to have all of you on board. Uh, good morning to folks in the US. Good afternoon to folks in Europe. And good evening to folks joining us from Asia. You know, a very, very warm welcome to today's exclusive webinar by Amplo Global. Uh, today's webinar is on sustainable packaging and how do we enhance customer value in supply chain. Uh, Amplo Global started this webinar series some time back and our endeavor is to bring in uh, these quarterly webinars on key topics of interest to both sustainability and business practitioners. You know, in a world where sustainability is really no longer a choice, but a critical imperative, we are very, very thrilled to put together an international panel of thought leaders today to discuss how sustainable packaging can drive innovation, resilience, and long-term value. I have great pleasure in our great panelists for today. We've got Balaji Jayasilan. Balaji is the Vice President for Sustainability for Berlin Packaging. He's based out of Chicago, uh, USA, and today, of course, he's joining us from LA, where he's there for a meeting. Uh, Balaji was just sharing with us a while back how he's one of those rare professionals who went into sustainability by design two decades back. And we, we all thought that was fantastic. Uh, you know, when sustainability was yet to be a buzzword for someone to actually choose. And that's how he went to the U.S. Uh, to complete his uh, uh, education in sustainability. So very warm welcome to you, Balaji. We're looking forward to your uh, insights around both packaging as well as sustainability and, you know, how you see sustainability impacting regular business every every day. Our next speaker would be Dr. Ahmed Shoki Mohammed. Uh, Dr. Shoki is someone wearing multi. He's he's had a you know very very uh, interesting journey. Uh, moved geographies, moved fields. Currently, he's based out of London, where he heads his startup Level Up ESG, which is really merging technology and ESG, and they are soon to come into market. Uh, in fact, next month uh, with his product. Uh, Dr. Ahmed uh, kind of moved into sustainability along the way, and today his, his business is around uh, merging ESG and tech. So very, very warm welcome to you, Dr. Shoki. A fantastic welcome to Moitri Nayak. Moitri is the, and Moitri represents like the, the CXO group or the industry group. Uh, she, as she herself said, I'm not a, a sustainability professional, Neither am I a techie, but sustainability and integration is what I do uh, as, as part of my role every day. So that's uh, fantastic. Moitri currently heads the glo is the Global Alliance Head for Digital Engineering for Persistent Systems. He, she's based out of New York, uh, and uh, we are very, very happy to have her today. And our final panelist is Abhi Mitra. Abhi is again a techie and a digital transformation person who's now moved into ESG. And like he says, uh, you know, I did a lot of digital transformation things, but today ESG itself is such an enterprise-wide change management system uh, that, that you know, I am bringing all my transformation skills to the table there. Uh, it, you know, it's just the shift is almost happening from tech to ESG in enterprise-wide transformation projects. Abhi also heads the Europe market for Amplo Global, and he's based out of Nottingham, UK. And uh, I'm Indrani. I'll be your moderator for the evening. Uh, by background, I'm an HR professional, uh, did HR for two decades, and like a lot of people here on this panel, kind of veered into ESG a couple of years back. ESG was an area of interest, and the more uh, you know, involved I become with ESG, the more I get to learn, and the more I realize just how much there is to learn and to do, you know, action, affirmative action. Great. So with that, I think, uh, uh, you know, we will dive straight into the the panel uh, discussion today. Uh, you know, like, like I was mentioning, uh, sustainability and businesses cannot be separated today. You know, there are businesses increasingly facing pressure to align profit with purpose. And we will explore how integrating sustainability 
into packaging strategies can really lead to stronger customer loyalty, better regulatory compliance, and a more resilient supply chain. And our focus today is, of course, ESG in the context of packaging and, and, and we'll unravel elements of the supply chain there. And, uh, you know, from packaging innovation and carbon accounting to climate financing and tech integration, we'll try and touch upon as many concepts as we can. So let's dive right into this and unpack how companies can embed sustainability into their core packaging strategies. So are we all ready for a great discussion? Great. And we, we also have more folks joining in. So I'll just let them in for a second and yeah, I'll get back. Okay. So let's, let's have, uh, let's start uh, with the man who moved into sustainability by design two decades back, Palaji. You know, and you know, my, my opening question to you really is uh, how can companies uh, integrate sustainability into their packaging strategies without really, you know, uh, disturbing customer value or or impacting product integrity. Thanks, Nirani, for the introduction as well. And um, um, and good afternoon, good morning, everybody. Um, so to kind of give you an understanding about sustainability, product integrity, and value creation, it's really not a mutually exclusive concept. Sustainability, especially in the world of packaging, but we can actually extrapolate that into any different sector is really about creating the value. So like any other group, like whether it is an information technology or whether it is marketing or any any other function, sustainability is really about creating the value. So it can really help companies to enhance the brand image. It can help based on the sector that what we have really identify opportunities with respect to cost, like whether operational savings or whether it's a supply chain optimization play. But also, if it is really done in the right way, basically integrated well within the business, it can provide you um, a market differentiation and a competitive advantage, which means to the fact that there is a lot more consumer preferences on sustainability today. So if you look upon a crowded market, how can I differentiate my particular brand with any other brand sustainability can really help and especially on the packaging and it really plays out really well if it is kind of done in the right particular way. So just to kind of foray into the sustainability packaging aspect of it, the most important thing is that is like in order to create the value for sustainability from a packaging point of view, we need to kind of really embrace what defines that value, right? For example, can this particular packaging create what we call it is from a design optimization perspective. Like, you know, can it really do the elements with respect to design to get a maximum benefit for that particular packaging, which kind of stands out in the brand. So a good example, which we work, excuse me, <coughs> is on, let's say if you work on the beverage sector, having a very light weighted wine bottle or basically a particular product that could be made a refill or a reuse particular bottle really helps the consumer to understand what are these benefits? What is the best way to kind of use this particular product? Kind of really enhances the portfolio as a part of it. And the second thing, if you really think about from a sustainable packaging strategy, there is a lot of innovation that's happening. So it's not only on the design optimization that can happen, but there is also the world where we can innovate some new materials. So as you could potentially see, uh, with all the information that you receive today, there is a lot of investment that's happening to make a particular, like let's say a compostable option product or a product that could have more recycled content within that, or also looking at traditional way of how a product is made and see, is there an, any other alternative or a sustainable way or a more efficient way to kind of make that product? So there's a lot more, what we call it as innovation that is kind of happening. A, a good example that I could, uh, the site is that recently there's been a paper-based bottles that are coming with Unilever's brand. So to just to give you a good context of value creation, sustainability plays a critical role, whether you're defining a circular economy principle or whether you're going to be using technology as a part of that as well. And with respect to product integrity, that's the most important denominator. It doesn't matter whether it is sustainability or whether it is engineering that what you're going to be working on we want to make sure to the fact choosing the right material, choosing the right technology kind of plays and also making sure 
the right testing gets into that aspect of it is what we kind of work on that as well. But finally, the most important element about sustainability with respect to packaging is the consumer aspect of it. A lot of brands, it doesn't matter whether you know, you're trying to introduce a new material or whether you're trying to really reshape the supply chain process. The most important thing is that how do they educate the consumer as well? So uh, as a person that works on the sustainability side, that's the key criteria that we like to So we want the consumers to understand we're not greenwashing it or we, we don't want to kind of cite a wrong claim as a part of it. So as a consumer, when I'm buying that particular product, I feel comfortable that this brand has done all the necessary things that they have done to create that value as well. So to just to kind of summarize this overall context of that is sustainability and value creation are definitely mutually exclusive. In fact, sustainability adds the flavor to actually make that product better. And the successful brands are the ones who can integrate those particular value and take it to the next level. Wonderful, wonderful. I think uh, the, the insight you brought in on how they are uh, exclusive and inclusive at the same time and how one adds to the other, that was very, very nice. And I think a great conversation starter for to set the tone for the, for the webinar. Great. Uh, I'd like to bring in Moitre now, and uh, Moitre, uh, by her own admission, uh, is is not a sustainability professional, but what she does today is really help integrate businesses uh, into the sustainability uh, you know transformation process. So, as a business consultant and now you know uh, let's say budding sustainability professional, uh, Moitre, uh, what are you seeing in the market uh, in terms of ESG data management? Excellent question, and I thank you for having me with this excellent um, panel. Um, so from a data management standpoint, there are a lot of different uh, things we are seeing, but I'm going to start in a place maybe a lot of us we don't like is our regulation, right? Yeah. As we know, our corporate world will move with our regulations, right? Um, we are seeing like uh, with the coming out, like, you know, in UA, I think uh, EU, we have CSRD with uh, USI, we have like... Uh, SBS and also TCF, TC, uh, TCFT, a lot of different kind of framework and regulations coming into the picture, right? And why are they coming? Um, and how are we going to manage on that? Like, what is the impact, right? We are seeing a lot of our customers are having, are, are kind of forced to go into that direction, some discussion and this change happened, I will say, in very recent future. It's not like everyone was thinking when, I will say ESG has been a buzzword for a long time, but now organizations are thinking. Why they're thinking? Because of at the end of the day, the financial component of it, right? The investors and others. And that is where I will say as a corporate, uh, individual consciousness is there, but as a corporate, as an organization enterprise are looking into those that we will have to uh, fulfill this regulatory requirement. Um, so a lot of data collections are happening. Uh, thanks to a lot of new technologies that we are seeing, which was not there before, right? So organizations are doing a different digital transformation. So that there are a lot of data collections from different ERP systems, uh, different IoT devices is, are happening. There are a lot of complexity also in collecting this data, right? Um, not all, there's not one source of data. So organizations are struggling but they are also looking into a platform-led uh, solution because having, this is a very, even though it's very, you know, when you say ESG, environmental, social, and governance, it's very easy to understand individually. But when you look into it, it's a pretty complex. It takes like a lot of things incorporated to get there, right? So having a platform-led solution is very good. And our customers are looking into that, that we are seeing. Uh, in the industry, but in the same time, uh, the data collection is also complex. Um, there are, you know, I, I see here so many uh, uh, like uh, professionals. We are, we are like, you know, by choice, by focus, by education, are so focusing on that. But that's not the case in a industry, right? Even what data to collect, that is a very complex thought process. So that is where a uh, lot of domain knowledge uh, industry vertical wise domain knowledge is needed. Those things are what you're saying. So we can definitely uh, like complexity part of the data collections. That is uh, one thing we are looking into like from a very granular data from our IoT devices to like uh, focusing on 
all different, you know, scope one, scope two, and scope three data. Uh, just to be non ESG language, like what is the emissions or what is like what the what is the emission like uh, organizations are uh, creating? Like if, even I'm going to give a very simple example of if you think when you. Uh, like I live in a New York City and I have seen a lot of people saying that, oh, I'm very carbon neutral kind of person, right? My organization is a very conscious person. But how you collect the data, like all different, like it's not like what is the, what are the, like if you work for a simple bank, even the armor truck that takes the, uh, you know, currencies and others, right? That is also creating uh, uh, some kind of emission. Then you as a professional going, going to your, uh, like, taking a transportation and going like, oh, there is also the, the part of the data. So if you want to see what is your carbon footprint or anything like that, ESG wise, if you have to consciously think that what you are contributing that, collection of that data is extremely complex. So we're seeing smaller, more like question, worriness in the industry and also trying to support everything with their data. Either it's to satisfy the investors or regulators and all of those things coming. A lot of investors are also focusing on third-party auditing. So it's not going to be uh, just like looking into that, hey, this is what I do and all of those kind of thing, right? Um, and that is where I will say investors are asking for uh, complex data, um, also clarity from that. Another very interesting thing we are seeing or previously, you know, Supply chain used to be very much like manufacturing industry discussion. Now that has changed, especially I will say after uh, like post pandemic, because we saw the hit what it happens, right? And I will say the consciousness or byproduct kind of became ESG as well, because when you start mapping who is my supplier and how I can prevent another pandemic or another crisis situation, more uh, mapping is being done. People are looking into that more. Organizations are looking into that kind of data. So those complex data are coming into the picture. And when you are throwing them in one place, you are getting a lot of other things that, okay, it's not like what I'm generating here, calling it as a very organic, sustainable product or uh, you know, operative, operating model. That has a lot of other implications, right? So supply chain is also kind of contributing in a... Uh, consciousness uh, level, I will say. There are a lot of risk uh, because not all, all the organizations are very mature in collecting those data. Uh, it's not that the, the data is not there, but capturing the correct data is also um, a very uh, like important aspect. And we are seeing that more consciousness around it that is happening. Uh, processes are there. Um, in fact, one of the very interesting uh, thing people don't think about, right, uh, blockchain. Blockchain can help you to kind of map a lot of uh, data without like any chances of alterations to just meet some goals, right? Because I have seen even in a very conscious group the question that, okay, we are doing all of these data collections. How do we know that these are accurate data? Um, so yes, there are a lot of different technology uh, embarrassments happening. Technologies are coming, technologies are there. Um, so we are we are seeing those impact. Uh, focus are increasing on data to how to kind of see the story. Of, and awareness and discussions are also happening. And it is not only just individual level anymore. It is in a very corporate industry level. Wow, wow. You know, in fact, as you were describing uh, the, the challenges and what you've seen on the ground, uh, I think a, a thought struck me was that, you know, these challenges would be common to any enterprise-wide big change management or big transformation efforts, right? It all starts, uh, companies struggle to bring in data-driven decisioning in, in their key areas. And uh, I think, I guess sustainability is no different. And, uh, you know, thank you for mentioning the the huge efforts required on collection and then on, on the data integrity, on ensuring that the, the integrity of the data is there. And uh, yeah, I think that was a very nice uh, allusion to a uh, blockchain. I mean, indeed it can, it can actually help uh, maintain integrity of the data. Very nice. And I think, uh, you know, if, if we have time, we'll, we'll delve a little bit deeper into that. But, uh, you know, from data, let me now uh, 
move into a little bit of pure plan and pure clay uh, uh, term. Uh, may I invite Dr. Shockey and, uh, you know, the carbon accounting is a term that I think most of us have heard. Some of us understand it. Some of us don't really understand what it is entirely. Uh, I'd like to ask you, uh, Dr. Shockey, you know, how can robust carbon accounting practices help businesses meet their net zero, uh, you know, targets while ensuring that in the long term, you know, the carbon reduction strategies are also being met. And and may I just request you to just maybe in a, in a simple line or two to also break it down, uh, the carbon accounting concept, break it down for some of us who may not really understand it technically. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you again for this important question. But I have something to uh, add to what Moitri mentioned about data collection because it's critical, really. Uh, a recent study showed that companies take an average over 8,000 hours to collect their ESG data. That's four FTEs, four full-time employees working to collect data. Uh, it's just a topic that I'm really passionate about and I can bring lots of data around that. Uh, going back to carbon and robust carbon accounting, breaking, breaking down or bringing the basics first, what does carbon accounting mean? It is the process of measuring and reporting greenhouse gases, GHG emission. And this process involves really quantifying, measuring, calculating the amount of emission produced by a company's operations, products, and services. When it comes to robust or advanced carbon accounting, it refers to a comprehensive and sophisticated approach for measuring and reporting all emissions, including scope three in the value chain, as also Moitri has just alluded to. Uh, so carbon accounting is very critical to achieve net zero targets. As the saying goes, what gets measured gets managed. <laughs> So we must measure and manage GHG emission to make a difference. Carbon accounting is the foundation of any effective climate action and ESG strategy, as it provides businesses with a clear understanding of their GHG emissions across all scopes, enabling them to one, identify hotspots for emission reduction by identifying the most significant sources of emissions so companies can focus their efforts into areas with significant impact. Second, to track progress over time and to make informed decision or adjustments as needed to stay on track for achieving net zero. And thirdly, robust carbon accounting supports comprehensive sustainability reporting, enhancing transparency, data collection, and amplifying stakeholders' trust. Carbon accounting practices are directly tied to global sustainability goals like UN SDGs and the Paris Agreement uh, 2015 for limiting global warming to 1.5 uh, uh, pre-industrial level. However, the reality deviates. Like sadly, a recent study by PSG found that almost 40% of organizations are still using Excel sheets for carbon accounting and only 10% of organizations are able to measure their total GHG emissions comprehensive. Only 10%, shocking. But <laughs> uh, I think as uh, our panel has just highlighted, technology is really advanced technology. It, advanced technology is uh, playing a transformational role. I would speak of AI. AI is changing the game entirely. A notable application of AI in carbon accounting is the classification of spent transaction into relevant complex scope three categories, ensuring, ensuring that the correct emission, emission factors are applied to the correct data. And this was previously a time consuming task, taking weeks, technical expertise for experts. But with AI now, this will take only a matter of hours or even minutes processing vast amount of data with high accuracy in a fraction of that time. So I'd like to highlight that at, at Level Up, Level Up ESG, we have used AI in carbon management in three impactful ways. One, automated carbon, uh, carbon data extraction and mapping it from the source document. So replacing the traditional data consuming approaches of batch or manual inputs. 
And the second is using ML models, machine learning models, and the predictive, predictive analytics to forecast emissions and estimate consumption. The third way is by identifying data anomalies using AI SOM models. So we can mitigate greenwashing. Um, to summarize, <laughs> robust carbon accounting is not just a tool for measurement, it is a strategic asset that drives long-term carbon reduction strategies. And by leveraging advanced technologies like AI, businesses can transform their approach to emission management and hit the triple bottom line, profit, people, and planet. I hope I addressed your question. Oh, wonderful. I think, uh, and you also, you know, thank you for breaking it down into simple uh, definitions and stepwise. It was, you know, you really simplified the thank you for that because uh, you know it's it's a term that we keep hearing but at least uh, I, I certainly gained from this thank you so much for that uh, and and I think the other takeaway for me personally is that like in every other field uh, even in in ESG data management and carbon accounting in particular uh, you you know AI and ML is here to stay and you mentioned another thing on around predictive analytics uh, on forecasting emissions I think that's a very, very interesting area, you know, um, to use predictive analytics to forecast emissions. I think that, that should be really next level. Fabulous. Thank you. And uh, maybe we might come back to this if, if there are some questions around that again for the audience. Great. Uh, you know, from carbon accounting, I do want to move into another term that we keep hearing, and that's climate financing. And uh, I'll, I'll bring in Abhi here. Uh, Abhi's handled large-scale enterprise-wide transformations, and uh, there, uh, you know, uh, he was he was discussing the change management processes uh, some time back, and it was very very interesting. So my question to Abhi is really, uh, how can companies use climate financing to balance uh, costs and benefits, you know, while uh, uh, they are on the sustainability agenda? And, and uh, you know, may I also request Abhi to break down climate financing into a simple definition for, for the benefit of some of us uh, who are not green professionals? Excellent. Uh, thank you, Indrani. <clears throat> Great you. question. Actually, you know, when I see the journey of the questions, we are all talking, oh, we need this, we need that. It's very costly, it's very expensive, it's really complicated. Eventually, when it comes to this, CSO, Chief Sustainability Officer. The Chief Sustainability Officer needs to build the case mm -hmm. because the, the purse is held by the CFO. The CFO is telling that, you know, in God, I believe everyone else bring evidence. So why should I be spending that money? And so it comes to who is going to build the cat? How do I unlock the CFO's purse string? to finance what I want to do. And that is where climate financing comes in. So, you know, we talked about the risk. We talked about the regulation. So any and every program that we execute to mitigate that risk, to meet that regulation, to meet that, uh, to, uh, to kind of achieve our obligation to, so for that matter, the Paris, Paris Agreement, any project that we execute, the money that goes for it is what I would, it's classified as climate financing. So what are the things that are, would be the finance through climate financing, things like regulatory things, greenhouse gas emission, carbon footprint, meeting the Paris Agreement obligation, climate risks, say for example, that for a supply chain, that how do I make sure that, you know, the sourcing is from a, locations that are uh, that are uh, immune to cl climate risk or for that matter what are the places where I, i'm getting it from then it comes to unlocking investors or in getting the investors investment in to finance them increasingly we are seeing the big banks the big investors they are looking into evidence for the companies to prove that they are into sustainability, they are executing the sustainability obligations or commitments uh, for, for them to invest in. Also, what is coming up is there are many regions that are coming up, what I would call the green markets. You could only operate in those markets if you are a, 
running a sustainable business. And lastly, it is preparedness for the future because increasingly regulations are going to come in. So yes, as far as the organization is concerned, there are a lot of moving objects. It is quite a task to assess that where my risks are, what I would call portfolio analysis of my risk. It's quite as touched upon by Moitri, uh, Ahmed, and the rest of the, all of the panel, biology. That you know, it is a daunting task to gather the information that I need to prepare my case. And I'm very glad to share that uh, Ampli Global's Amplify 4.0 platform is one such product that is really helping the organization to bring that, give them the technology and with the under uh, the data that underpins it to do what I would call the benchmarking. And we are doing that, including in the packaging industry. Do the benchmarking as to what the regulation is, what the climate risks are, what are my peers doing to figure out where I sit in the market. Using the product also, the risk assessment module, I am able to determine, our organization is able to determine, get a clear picture of the regulatory climate and the other opportunities to come up with a plan of action or as I would call the roadmap of activities that they need to do along with the very clear cut kind of a milestones of things that need to be done and it is and also having a RAC status to determine what needs to be done in the priority order to unlock myself into the opportunities that I listed upon get into the green market or meet my regulatory obligation, or for that matter, uh, meet my carbon commitments. So the next stage is to prepare the business case. So now we are able to, the CSO is able to prepare the business case with facts in hand, that this is where I stand, this is what my risk is, and without doing these actions, we are these, uh, this is what we are looking at for ourselves. <clears throat> As a result, what happens is we are able to create a business case. That is what the climate finance business case is with very clear return on investment, getting the things like getting on the right side of the regulation, meeting the our carbon footprint obligation. It is elevating the company's brand value out there in the market, ability to attract the investors, and obviously to also unlock opportunities into operating into the green markets. So yes, there is a lot of opportunities to unlock, but at the same time, various organizations are in various stages to unlock that uh, climate financing. Not only looking at the return of investment, the company's leadership are seeing the value in it, unlock the money. At the same time, there is a lot of support uh, or government funding uh, that, that are also available. Example, government grants, uh, green bonds, to name a few that the companies can use to you know, execute those programs. So that's in nutshell, uh, the climate finance part of it. So when we come to what is the carbon uh, offset, so using, doing my climate finance initiative, I have, I have able to, kind of meet my carbon obligations as that I am committing to. The rest is to fast track my carbon net zero. Say for example, as an organization, I want to get net zero by 2030. So through my climate financing programs, I'm able to achieve a percentage of it. The rest of the percentage, what I could do is I could pay for projects programs that will do it. So And that way I buy that from the market, which is called carbon offsetting. That's in a very short layman terms, how I would put climate financing and how it relates to carbon offset. So they complement each other in eventually helping the organization to get to net zero, organization to meet its regulatory object objectives and for the, for the betterment of the society and the globe. Okay, the, look, thank you for, you know, unpacking that uh, climate financing is not an easy concept. So thank you for unpacking that. Uh, great. Uh, I think it's now time to uh, bring back our, uh, you know, sustainability professional from the packaging industry specifically, uh, 
and I'm uh, inviting Balaji again. Uh, Balaji, you know, what role does circular economy play in packaging and how can businesses implement the various initiatives? Let's take waste management as an example, okay? Waste reduction while addressing, because it's now no more just the organization themselves, but you know, you have to address scope three emissions across the entire supply chain. So if you can, you know, just help us connect these dots around circular economy, scope three, the entire supply chain and, you know, waste reduction, any such strategy, how do you ensure that it's implemented throughout your supply chain? Uh, Balaji, uh, are you able to hear me? Okay, that question was for Balaji, but I am not sure if he is... Uh... Oh, okay. Balaji had a network issue. So I'll, I'll just repeat the question. Yeah. Hi, Balaji. Sorry. Uh... No worries. Sorry. Uh, were you able to hear my question or would you like me to repeat uh... Just in the last 15 seconds, because my system. Oh, okay. okay, okay. No worries, no worries. No, so my question was uh, uh, really uh, uh, to the uh, supply chain professional, uh, to the sustainability professional who's also working in the packaging industry, and uh, wanted to understand that uh, how can companies, uh, I, mean, I mean, what role does circular economy really play in packaging? And you know when businesses are implementing any sustainability initiative, let's let's a waste reduction, for instance, or or any emission related initiative. How do you address the scope three emissions? Because now you've got to also include the entire supply chain, uh, not just your own organization. So if you can just help unpack that a little bit for us. Uh, definitely, Jani. So if you think about um, any packaging industry as such, or if you really think about the concept of packaging. The majority of the emissions actually rely on the scope three emissions. So if you think about from our sector, like or from our um, industry as such itself, if you look upon from a mapping of the emissions, more than 60 to 65 percent of our emissions resides on the scope three categories as well. So within like to just to kind of deconstruct scope three, I know audiences are in different form, shapes and sizes today is that is like, uh, when we look up on scope three emissions, there are 15 different types of scope three emissions, right? So whether uh, to kind of give a little bit more clarity, what are scope three emissions for people that, uh, you know, are getting into the world of carbon is like those emissions, which we don't financially or operationally control. So which means to the fact it's not our electricity, it's not basically the fuel that we use. So when we are really looking at the scope three emissions, especially from the packaging sector, we look on two elements. One is on the upstream aspects of the emissions. The other one is the downstream aspects of the emissions. So when we are looking at upstream uh, aspects of the emission, it's basically the purchase goods and services. What we mean is like, what are the raw materials that we end up buying in terms of our emissions as a part of that, right? And then there are other elements pertaining to things like what are the transportation emissions that is the basically the upstream portion of it like the stuff that actually gets transported as a part of it but the most important criteria is also when you're looking at the downstream aspects of it is really looking like how do you look upon that particular package when you use the product so today if you think about regulations across the world or let's say whichever the geographies that you belong, there is a lot of regulations restricting, let's say, I don't want to use a single use plastic, right? So that's kind of a certain example of like a downstream. But then when you start to correlate with the emissions, we wanted to understand what is the waste aspects that really relates with that particular product. And going back to your question about circular economy, is there a way for us to build that value by making sure that that particular product does not end up in a landfill? Is there an opportunity to make it recyclable? Is there an opportunity where the things that are actually discarded, can I make another product again using recycled content as well? So if you really, really look back again, uh, the nexus between a carbon emission, which I mentioned is called as like, you know, the scope three on what products that you buy, like say, for example, I'm buying a glass product and that glass tends to be a little bit more heavier uh, and it also tends to have a little bit higher emissions compared to a plastic. But I need a product that lasts longer. I'm not planning to use a single use. 
glass tends to favor a little bit more better than a plastic that might has to have that same application. So it's always a trade of decisions. Uh, the emission that kind of correlates with that particular thing has to look in terms of what's happening from the upstream side, mm -hmm. what happens in the aspect of the product getting discarded. But the most fundamental thing, more than emissions from a scope three perspective, is that it's like, how do we use the particular product? How do we build an ability that tomorrow I'm creating a design that can be recyclable? What are the collaborations and partnerships that we could build in the end, which means to the fact as a company, uh, professional working on sustainability, how could we build that uh, collaborative relationship with a recycler? How do we uh, join forces with other companies to build that value chain that makes sure to the fact that there is an infrastructure built in partnership with either the governmental agencies or a private partnerships to build that particular ability for that particular product to get recycled. So if you really rethink about the whole idea of scope three, so what scope three helps us to is really quantify either whether it's a purchase goods or services, upstream transportation, use of sold goods. But it, the most important thing is like taking that emissions, understanding the nexus between, okay, these are my emissions. Okay, is there a way for me to mitigate those emissions? So for example, if it's on the transportation side, can I think about efficient ways to optimize my network to finally look upon from the use of the product or, or as a consumer, can I easily read that particular product instructions to discard it in the right way so that if this particular product gets recycled, my emission actually gets reduced as well. I, I, so there is absolutely value creation in every different point. It's really, really how we started this conversation. What these emissions really help you is to really segment that. And based on the segmentation, we can really think about how do we kind of mitigate it and how do we improve it as well. Great. And, and you know, could you substantiate that with any uh, uh, live example or, or a live experience yeah. that you all may have had it at Berlin? Uh, that would, I think, yeah. really amplify the learning. Sure. So I'll give you a good uh, example of a recent project that I had worked uh, with, with. So this particular company makes uh, laundry and detergent products, right? It's very... Uh, a very effective uh, laundry detergent using plant enzymes. So it was really something that they felt that they had a sustainability ingredient in place because it was all done. So we felt to the fact as a consumer, you know, there is going to be a benefit for that particular consumer to use this particular product. But then we realized to the fact also is that it's like, how do we build a particular ecosystem of value to the customer so that the customer will come back and keep using the product on a multiple different ways and multiple times. So if you look upon a traditional linear value chain, it's like you go to a retail store, let's say you pick up this particular detergent, you use this detergent, you might just kind of, uh, you know, after its use, you might just throw it in a blue bin in case if it's potentially to recycle or not. So, but what we thought about this particular line is that it's like because of the ingredient that what it is and because of the ability for us to create a circular economy model, instead of doing a traditional uh, linear supply chain, we built an entire circular chain by making this entire product as a refillable one. So what we ended up doing from a design point of view, from a packaging perspective is that is we looked upon the entire stream and it was and one thing that also benefited for this particular product because they were in a what we call emerging brand, what we decided that it would be great to build this entire direct to consumer channel from a refillability perspective where we designed the entire ecosystem. So what do we mean by that ecosystem is that is we created a refillable bottle. We created uh, a starter kit, which means to the fact is like as a consumer is interacting with this particular product, they will know how to do the refill. But the most important thing is that is if you think about how consumer thinks about cleaning products, they would definitely keep it under their shelves or some place where that is hidden. So what we said to the fact, is there an opportunity for us to make this particular product that they could actually keep it on their living room? So we completely changed the design of how a cleaning product should look and made it a little bit more attractive. And what do we mean by very attractive is that we made using a glass bottle with a silicon rub rubber so that it looks like a good living room product that they could keep it on this one. So there is a 
visibility for that particular product and even when the refill like whenever the concentration goes down we would be able to get a refill and we actually built a track and trace technology for that as well so that there is an ability for the consumer to get back so when you build that particular principle we really took that particular brand from an early stage startup today that particular brand is pretty much one of the most leading detergent brands in terms of creating an entire circular economy as well so that is the whole system thinking. And if you really rethink about from a carbon emissions, I know the question was starting about carbon emissions, the current carbon emissions before this refill, uh, let's say it was around uh, 65 kilograms of CO2 per bottle, but today they are refilling this particular bottle more than five to 10 times. It is currently less than seven kilograms. So there is a significant carbon reduction, more than 80 to 90% by introducing the concept. Again, it does not happen in day one. That's something about sustainability. It is a process of helping the consumer to think in a different way, uh, but you also have to help the consumer to think in a different way. You need to build your supply chain. And the most important thing is the fact is like, it's almost like an ecosystem of a story where we are constantly interacting with the customer and making sure it, it is done right and we can learn the lessons as a part of it. Wow, what a fascinating example of of really turning a a washing thing into a you know an into an item that you would actually like to display in your living room, and then also embedding it with the track and trace uh, technology. Fabulous example. Thank you for sharing that and 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 your response before that. Wonderful, great. Uh, I want to move to Dr. Shockey again. Uh, and uh, you know, let's assume that let's say I'm representing a packaging company, uh, a mid sized small, you know, just mid-sized packaging company where I'm now uh, required to con uh, comply. I want to reduce my, uh, pack, uh, my uh, you know, sustainability. Uh, I want to be sure of my impact on the planet. I'm a kind of a small, we're moving to medium-sized packaging company based out of Europe. And I want to obviously be also compliant, let's say, with CSRD and other regulations. Now, if that was the context, and you earlier mentioned about carbon accounting and, and how you know technology is also getting merged with it, uh, can you help this small medium company uh, get onto the right start uh, using concepts of carbon accounting? Can carbon accounting help this company basically become not just compliant uh, uh, around CSRD and other things, but also truly you know be on the sustainability journey? Oh. Thank you for the question. Of course, absolutely. Um, so the packaging industry must measure, manage, and report on their carbon emission to meet the CSRD requirements, as you just highlighted in Europe. Um, so the industry stands at a really a critical juncture as, uh, as a sector with significant environmental and social impact. It has both a responsibility and the opportunity to lead the charge in sustainability. So to give some context about the sector in general before we get into SME. The global sustainable packaging market is projected to reach over 400 billion by 2027, uh, 2027, according to the Market Research Future Institute. This isn't just a trend now, it, it, it is a requirement. It requires a dramatic change in business model. I really enjoyed what Alaji said, it relates to what I'm saying now. So really requires a dramatic change in the business model and how we conduct business. So CSRD mandates comprehensive sustainability reporting, including a detailed disclosure of environmental impacts like biodiversity and GHG emissions. So robust carbon uh, accounting can help SMEs and larger organizations equally really in the packaging uh, sector in four, in four impactful ways. One, meet disclosure requirements by providing accurate comprehensive data on GHG emissions across all scopes. Second, set scientific-based targets aligned with global climate goals. Third, track progress by allowing for year-on-year -year or month-on-month -month comparisons and the progress reporting. The fourth way is guiding innovation. I like also how Alaji highlighted the importance of innovation in the industry. So what I would like to add really is about the carbon accounting isn't just about numbers, it's about insights. By highlighting areas of high emissions, we can focus on innovation, um, our innovation uh, efforts on where we will have most impact. For example, a recent study by McKinsey, I like to bring the numbers, 
found that sustainable packaging innovation could reduce plastic waste by 20% and create uh, between 10 to 15 billion value annually in the industry. So as a climate critical sector, the packaging industry would go beyond compliance, putting purpose and impact at the core of their business model. So I believe carbon accounting is a gift and a powerful tool to make that impact. Again, optimizing material selection. And I think also Balaji somehow highlighted that, improving energy, energy efficiency, enhancing supply chain. And I think my colleagues have highlighted that enough across supply chain that represent over 60%. I believe Balaji said 60%, if I got it right. I thought it's 70%, but he said 60% He's the expert in that. So, uh, so to summarize, robust carbon accounting isn't just a compliance tool. It is a strategic asset to enable that would enable us to meet regulatory requirements, reduce environmental impact, drive sustainable innovation. So let's measure, manage, and make a difference. Fantastic, fantastic. And a quick, uh, you know, rejoinder to that. You know, when let's say as a company, I'm planning to do this, and you know, I will leverage carbon accounting and technology. And when I'm making a budget for the year at the start of let's say the annual operating year or the financial year. Uh, can carbon accounting provide inputs into my business budgeting so that, you know, I have the resources to integrate my sustainability agenda along with my business agenda? Um, it helps in reallocating resources where they are most impactful. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's that's the answer I would assume, yeah. Right, right. No, so I think that that's helpful because you did mention that it does throw up areas which require priority action. So yes. yeah, th and and that therefore provides a guide map for innovation and action to the companies while budgeting. No, that was very helpful. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Shakti. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm just letting Balaji in. I think he dropped off. Cool. Okay, I'll uh, move to Moitri now and. Moitri, in your earlier uh, uh, question, you you talked about the ESG data management piece, and you know the ch the real challenges you face. Uh, you see companies facing on the ground in their enterprise wide transformation or sustainability transformation piece. Just building on that, uh, you know, I I want your view on you know how can technology and you know overall system because that that's really what you do for a living. The overall systems integration. How can that, you know, the tech and the systems integration, which is part tech, part techno functional stuff, how can that support companies uh, when they are embarking on their you know, enterprise by transformation and, you know, they want to achieve their net zero targets and, and their climate action goals? How, what's been your experience as you help companies uh, integrate their sustainability agenda and their, you know, enterprise wide goals? using tech and systems integration principles? This is an exciting question. Um, so why it is exciting, right? As we are talking about this whole financing part of it and how to do, you know, net zero and all of this kind of things. This is like how you stitch it, stitch it all, right? So I can tell you as an SI company or even Antler Global is very helpful in this kind of situation. What we can help or how we can make this happen, right? Um, we can help you in an efficient data collection, uh, real-time monitoring, like efficient, you know, uh, decision-making. There is like a 20 different things we can do, but I'm going to touch on a few of them, which I feel like very important and it's pretty much like in everyone's mind. Like end-to-end -end integration part of it, right? In one organization, no matter whatever sector, industry, whatever you thought, think, right? There are several source of data that you need to consider. So we can definitely help you to create a centralized like collection, centralized platform, right? Because it's not, uh, I will say like, still I know some organization that when we're having a conversation with our customer, they're like, oh, I'm under compliance. I know, how do you know? Here you go, my Excel sheet. But your Excel sheet is not going to cut through anymore, right? Because of all the compliance. And also, the biggest thing is the investors. Newer investors, all the new you know, millennials and Gen Z, they demand a correct, accurate data 
not in an Excel sheet, but in a very curative manner of collection. So definitely we can help you to create that centralized platform where you can not only just see your current state or the risk you are exposed to, we can also help you to kind of look into uh, you know, what will be your transition. Um, as Avi was mentioning about the financing part of it, right? If you want to effort one of all or any or avail any of this financial uh, financing part of it, climate financing, you will have to support your ongoing process and journey with the data to show where you are today, how you're mitigating the risk and all of those things. So we can definitely help you to create that, that as a centralized ESG platform for your organization. We can help you to seamlessly connect with your all ERP systems and others. And also like for uh, different IoT uh, sensors kind of thing. I know you asked about practical example, right? I can uh, tell you there are uh, organizations who have like IoT devices to monitor uh, moisture in the environment and kind of taking that data they are especially in the agriculture uh, industry right taking that data they are working with the irrigation system now getting those data if you don't know what is the environmental data like what is the weather condition today you may have set your irrigation system to go every day for like three hours right that is a water consumption. You are impacting your organization. But if you can see and monitor that, okay, this is what I'm environmental data I'm seeing, and this is where I am, like, and and it is uh, not possible to do any of these in a very like uh, manual manner. But at least you can get started. There comes all AI, machine learning, and all the predictive analytic tools into the picture. We can help you to build solutions and come up with those where it can customize for your need, your industry and where you want to be because that is a leadership de decision that is an organizational decision and it's not easy to land into those decisions that where i want to be right so what is your how you want to reduce your carbon footprint you, you will never able to get into that um like answer unless and until now what is your current footprint we can help you to integrate those data scenario analysis and I also touched previously about supply chain uh, optimization, right? Um, the funny thing, I know initially when Google came and started showing, right, uh, not initially, like the optimum uh, optimum route for your, uh, within US, how you can like touch all the cities and others. But I think now we need an optimal route, how I can reduce less emission to go from point A to point B. That is some kind of data that we need to look. And that is where maybe your supply chain can come into the place, right? How you can optimize that. That will also lead you to all uh, energy uh, management and solution part of it, right? Uh, it will help you if you need to do any kind of, because of neutrality, if you want to do any uh, partner with any organization, which will able to help you to compensate your uh, emission and all of those kind of things, right? Uh, and as we're talking about data, you know, one interesting thing I will say, people don't think in this manner, even I didn't think in this manner, I believe in 2022, there was a survey was done and data center itself, they consume 2% of the world elect electricity demand in a year. Just think about it. I think it is around 460 uh, terawatt. So the 2% of entire world's electricity demand is being consumed by a data center. That's a wow. huge, right? Wow. So that kind of shows as a human race, we're already so late in the game. So how do we expedite that? That is where like efficiency, collecting the data, looking into the, you know, just dropping on the act and looking into actually where we are, first and foremost, understanding that. So as an organization, like I'm definitely, I'm biased to my organization, right? As a persistent, we work very closely on that. A lot of organizations are creating nowadays excellent customer experience centers and all of those things before you do that you can literally measure and see that okay maybe i can what is the impact is going to do like whatever the new creation i'm doing as even balaji was mentioning like one product you're creating what is the impact on all of those things you can do and you can see and that is where i will say a lot of digital twin solutions are coming into the picture so also a lot of like environmental um like especially disaster management wise, right? Uh, climate analysis wise, if you have a particular, uh, let's say office or a unit in certain uh, area where it is like a very uh, risk prone uh, from 
natural calamities and others, right? Uh, so you can look into that with your digital twin. You can ahead of time you can see how to do the business continuity and also reducing the damage or what will be your uh, plan in case of calamities and others, right? So that is where also we can help you with a lot of different uh, solutions uh, as a system, like you know, technology company. Then as we were talking about the financing part of it and investors part of it, I also touched about uh, blockchain traceability of the data that is uh, going to feed it in that because as the regulations are coming and we are looking into reporting everything about the organizations for uh, regulatory or investment, a lot of solutions that can be built and a lot of our, we, we do see industry wise, those are getting built and people are tracking, right? That is where the carbon credit tracking and all of those kind of things are happening as well. Wow. Um, I already wow. touched about cloud company and sustainability, flexibility kind of thing, right? It's not that, oh, I went to cloud and all things are done. I'm very carbon neutral company now. You also need to know that which cloud you're using, how much are you consuming, what is the impact you're creating as well, right? Um, so, to be touch, you know, to, to, to discuss, there's a lot of different kind of things we can do. And I may sound like a little bit of marketing thing, but yes, uh, any organization I will advise if you want to work like, you know, organize domain organizations like domain companies or like, you know, Amplo Global with their platform and also like SIZ like us. There are a lot of technologies and things that they are currently in place. We can absolutely help you in your journey to be, you know, mitigate the risk and also be a conscious or a leader in your in the industry from a ESG standpoint. Wow, I hope I answered your question. Oh, right? you know, in fact, I wish we had more time. In fact, you've given us, uh, given me certainly the idea for the next topic for the next webinar. And I think we need a full webinar on just ESG tech and, you know, unpacking each of those elements because it's just, it's suddenly become just high, high tech kind of uh, industry. Yes. Uh, you know, even, even one thing I will also touch, I, I, you know, we don't think in a conscious, in a conscious manner our employee and their training and how they are going on moving into, right? Uh, we're so excited about all of these uh, chat GPT or uh, Gen AI technologies. But as an organization, I think you need a time to do the transition or educate your entire employees or your you know workforce to make that positive impact also, which is a part of the governance and sustainability part of it as well, right? So if you don't know where your employee stands and their education level and others, you not will not able to do that. So it's not like just a manufacturing industry or something like that. It is applicable to anyone and everyone where we can build several solutions. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think we'll need, like I mentioned, a whole webinar on that. So we, we are out of time, but with everybody's permission, I will take one more minute because, you know, uh, just go back to the packaging industry. And I want to ask Abhi this because Abhi, I know, works very closely with a lot of industries and packaging is, is a particular domain area that they're focusing on currently. Uh, what in your experience, Abhi, as you, you know, talk to clients and potential clients, uh, you know, how do companies really balance out their, you know, their current packaging strategies? How do they align that with their, let's say, long-term climate resilience uh, uh, strategies? And if there are any challenges, how do they uh, balance them out or, or actually overcome them? A quick uh, answer, because we, we are already out of time. So unfortunately, we won't have time for any uh, audience questions, etc. We can take them later on, maybe. Uh, Abhi, quickly. Of course, I shall keep it to the minimal. I would like to draw a persona here to help set the context. So we have heard a lot of things about, you know, AI and purist and things. End of the day, if I'm wearing the hat of the CFO, I'm ac accountable to various conflicting stakeholders. Say, for example, my, uh, the, uh, my shareholders, they want the most out of the business. And the challenge is with the in the the regulation is not uniform globally. Say, for example, the single use plastic. The fact of the matter is that the CPGs are growing most in the growing markets. And there, the definition of single use of plastic is very different from that of us in Europe. So quite naturally, I as a CFO is between a rock and a hard place. Do I go the purest way? or do I take the practical way? So what is happening is that the best thing to address this, what I would call is modular designing. 
I make my packaging such that it is using the minimal amount of material, example, flat pack. And that way, when depending upon the market, I use the material there. Okay. So in case the regulation is changing, I just change the material. So that's one example. The other is we talked about, you know, technology and others. I'm sure Balaji and all would under, uh, can resonate with me. Businesses are of different size and shapes. So, you know, investing in technology is not cheap. So there as well, a mitigation option that we bring to the table is Amplo Global, is that, you know, partnering with startups, partnering with universities, and Amplo Global is leading that. We partner with uh, technology institutes, leading technology institutes in India. Using artificial intelligence, we are helping packaging industry to kind of come up with innovative ways of packaging at the same time, keeping their R&D costs as to the minimum. Uh, so just a couple of things. I am. I know we are running out of time. We can talk a lot on this. I can take more questions on this. But uh, yes, just to give some snippets of how the packaging industry is addressing these challenges. Well, thank you very much for that, Abhi. I think that was very interesting, the concept of modular packaging that you made. Basically, plug and play, you know, uh, I think the term agile should now also be coming into sustainability and 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 any industry, not just packaging, you know, plug and play, quick, quick transformations. But, you know, thank you very much to our wonderful panelists and uh, to everybody who tuned in today. Uh, I know we've already got requests for the recording from those who could not tune in. Uh, so we will, we will share that. Uh, Unfortunately, we don't have time for uh, questions, but uh, you all can engage with uh, with Amplo Global social media page on LinkedIn and you know sign in there. We will share the recording there. But thank you very much, uh, Moitri Nayak, Dr. Amit Shoki, Balaji Jayasilan, and Abhimitra for really unpacking a you know a complex term in in a very nice, easy storytelling manner, sharing uh, your experiences and. And I think really showing us that, uh, you know, the the we had to do a lot of things yesterday, but at least let's start doing some of the some of those things today, and uh, you know, helping companies put in place their their infrastructure, their invest. It's no more a a good to have thing. You have to plan for it. You know, a leverage technology, put in place the investments and the budgets, get expert help from let's say companies like Ample Global and Level Up. Uh, to accelerate your processes and and really you know integrate that entire sustainability transformation piece. Sustainability and business are no more separate. It is indeed profit with purpose. Thank you very much for your time, and we'll see you in the next webinar soon. Thank you.